Welcome to Center Stage, where educational video finds itself in the wake of the COVID-19 global pandemic with schools uh, shutting down face-to-face -face instruction and moving to a fully online format. Uh, this has uh, affected all the schools all around the world, uh, K through 12, uh, even daycare, um, up to universities and, and all of us. So. Uh, let's introduce the panel first. I am Liam Moran. I work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I provide broad range of uh, video services, both pedagogical and technical, and I also write the regular education column for Streaming Media Magazine. Let's take it to uh, Bill. Can you introduce yourself? And Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Cherney. I'm from the Chicagoland area. I'm the Vice President of Customer Success and Support over at MediaSite. Uh, we have our own video streaming platform and I have been helping uh, universities, corporations, and everybody in between uh, manage and create video for a few years now. So coming up on uh, 13 or 14 years, I'm starting to lose track. It's been a while, but thanks for having me. And then Eric, take it away. Yeah, I'm Eric Nicely from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, I'm the lead streaming engineer there. Uh, we supported some of the Zoom platform for campus uh, before COVID-19 took over. And since then, we're kind of full blown, doubled our uh, staff for supporting uh, conferences and have been able to uh, start leading uh, the campus for some of that uh, Zoom support. A lot of webinars, a lot of uh, live events utilizing the Zoom webinars and you know hybrid, hybrid models. We still run uh, three of our studios live uh, with limited participants coming into the studio with hybrid of Zoom uh, participants. And so it's just been a real, uh, real interesting uh, change of everything and a few things that we'll share throughout the uh, hour here. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Martin. I work at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And this is actually an exciting week for me. This is my nine week anniversary working there. So uh, pretty excited about that. I'm part of the IT team on campus. So I wear a lot of different hats. I work with a lot of faculty and staff. So that's been a big part of my role recently is getting uh, the entire campus online. Um, another part of what I do and one of my favorite parts of my job is the live streaming and uh, video production I get to work on. Uh, one of the kind of places on campus that I support is the Kelly Writers House, uh, which hosts 150 events uh, live in person each year and all of them, almost all of them at least, are live streamed and recorded and made available for replay. And since 2012, I have been uh, working in the MOOC space, Massive Open Online Courses. That acronym isn't winning any awards for coolest acronym award anytime soon. Um, but I get to work on them and they're a lot of fun. Uh, the course I've worked on is Modern and Contemporary American Poetry on Coursera, which has had more than 200,000 students over the past eight or nine years. Uh, but one of the cool things we get to do as part of that, it's, it's mostly pre-recorded videos, but uh, we spend uh, each fall offering 10 to 12 live sessions where students are given the opportunity to you know, have an interactive experience with the uh, professor and his teaching assistants. Uh, so you'll be able to call in and ask questions over Twitter and things like that. So it's one of uh, my favorite things I get to work on. And finally, Justin. I'm sorry, Justin, you're muted. Okay. There you go. Hi, I'm Justin Schroyer. I work at The Ohio State University. Uh, my group, uh, I, I'm the head of a video production group, uh, and we do everything from course content videos to marketing pieces to more like corporate like features. Um, but in the couple decades that I have been there, we've done everything from live streaming to video conferencing. Um, we basically have done the full gambit of anything media related, photography, just pretty much all of it. Um, the department I'm currently with um, has all of the um, online degree bearing programs coming through it. So we're doing a whole lot of instructional design, instructional technology consults, um, and just all of that, the whole ball of wax that's in, entailed with that. Fantastic.
Through, throughout this uh, webinar, we're going to be uh, launching some polls. So the first one is going out right now. What is your role uh, with educational video? And then let's get to our first topic, which is uh, after COVID-19, how did things change for you? Let's look back at what was our reaction to this, uh, to this event. And Justin, would you like to start out with that one? Uh, sure. Well, so our role, um, initially, we drastically slowed down because everybody else that we typically work with and support was in a you know, quick drop everything, get everything that's not already online, online mode. Um, and then as you know, that got in place and things started getting ironed out. Um, we are now doing a lot more consulting um, with the instructors for how they can DIY different recordings. Um, and then we've eventually shifted into kind of more um, the role that we had before where we're doing a lot of recordings for um, highly produced um, course intro videos and things of that nature. But instead of coming into our studio physically, we're doing recorded Zoom calls and then doing a lot of post-production on those. Chris? Uh, the word you mentioned, Liam, uh, was reaction. Like, how do we react to COVID, uh, the COVID situation? And I think that's, um, we're kind of in the epitome right now of reactive versus proactive uh, in the university setting where, you know, we're, we're, we're we were kind of just, uh, we were on like a life raft trying to get through the spring semester. And now we have time to kind of think about the fall semester. So I, I think, um, a big part of our role going forward is going to be kind of reconceptualizing, uh, uh, you know, the, the courses and how we use video in them and knowing our streaming tools so well that we can kind of provide creative solutions for, uh, for faculty as well as, you know, uh, events and remote recordings and podcasts that normally happen in person, things like that. And Eric? So... We, we kind of saw a little bit of that uh, hint of this might be happening. And uh, so the, the studio portion that I'm part of, we're also part of the greater IT uh, department on campus, just like uh, Chris is. And uh, so we started getting um, different re response groups uh, activated so that we could start task tasking different people to handle different parts of it. Uh, we were sure that we were going to have problems with, we have a very traditional faculty base that was not ready to be going online at all. We had uh, over 3,000 professors and nearly a thousand of those had not even turned on the uh, LMS tool, the learning management uh, tool for uh, classes. So not only did they weren't familiar with it, but they literally had never touched it. And so we had a team of 30 just that I was also a part of because I, I have a background in academic technologies with the group that supports uh, that directly. And so I played a dual role between supporting direct calls with faculty of how do I turn Zoom on? How do I uh, get my course into, you know, the, the video tool turned on in my course to uh, we also took all of our um, studios and flip them as quickly as we could to be automatic uh, uh, recording studios. So making it to where uh, Panopto is our uh, uh, tool to do classroom recordings. We made it to where they could walk in, a operator could start the record for them, do the labeling, have it automatically go into the system and automatically dump into the uh, LMS system for them. So it, it was as automated as possible. And we only had 15 classrooms and our three studios that were functional for that for some of these uh, professors, because we have a lot of, you know, of course, biology and math and chemistry that have a lot of equations that still needed to be able to do heavy diagramming. And so they would come in and use light boards uh, in our studio to be able to do a light board presentation, diagram everything out, do the conversation, and then walk away and five minutes later, it's automatically you know into their class for them. So it was a lot of uh, real quick trying to automate as much as possible because there's no way you can handle that many professors with manual touches and a lot of education, a lot of documents were produced uh, as quickly as possible. There is uh, just teams of people that were just writing docs on how, how to get things done and how 
how do you use Zoom? How do you most securely use Zoom after the Zoom bombing issues that were popping up? And what's best practices? And so just the amount of docs that were produced was phenomenal by itself. That's a similar, similar reaction to here where we had, we, the first thing that we had to do is create courses for every, for every course in the learning management systems. And a lot of the teachers had never seen them before, had never used them. And so the transition to, from nothing from only having experience teaching face-to-face -to, -face to that baseline of like, I understand what the tools are and how to get into them and, and use them very basically. And then now we're transitioning to raising that, that bar much, much higher. Uh, Bill, uh, MediaSite's a global um, video provider. So can you kind of provide your, your unique uh, perspective on this and then kind of transition us into from the reaction to things to what, what are we doing moving forward to make uh, the summer and the fall semesters a much better experience for our students and the teachers. Yeah, certainly. It's um, like everybody, I think out there, it's been a very long, what month are we? June? <laughs> so very long, you know, six months. Um, and really, we saw a lot of this starting with our customers in China when towards the end of 2019, COVID was starting to become a thing. And a lot of them went on to, you know, the holiday break and Chinese New Year, and we were getting a few requests um, to basically help them plan for a spring semester or an extended winter semester that would be more remote. And there's, for our customers, there's really two aspects to it. So we have customers that can purchase our server software and run it in the cloud. They didn't really have too much of a concern. Uh, China is a little bit of a different story because of data centers and everything. But for a lot of customers that run media site on-prem or in their own hardware, they had to really look at it hard and say, well, we built this infrastructure to support, you know, a hundred concurrent users maybe a few terabytes a year, you know, kind of, they had their set business use case and all of that's been thrown out the window. And they're like, well, how do we support, you know, a few terabytes a week of data and potentially uh, we, we, you know, we're going from maybe supporting 50, hundred classes to now every class needs to eventually be conducted somehow um, using a video conference, web conferencing or on-demand videos and then stored for on-demand access. So that was one part of the problem is just how do you build up infrastructure quickly when nobody can get on campus? Um, so for our on-prem customers, that was, uh, we spent a lot of January, February, March <clears throat> having those discussions and basically trying to run as fast as you can to buy hardware, buy networking gear and tie in with CDN providers if, if they wanted to go that approach. So that was one half of my, uh, my team's headaches from the customer success perspective, just helping them get there. Um, the people that were in the cloud, then, you know, we, we, uh, we also had to grow our cloud infrastructure to handle that as well. And, and, and no other online vendors, you know, experience similar, um, similar growing pains. It's like suddenly viewership is skyrocketed and the content being created is skyrocketed. And, and, you know, so cloud infrastructure had to be expanded as well. The other piece was, I think that we saw, uh, reflects more like what all of you were saying, because you're in the trenches dealing with instructors, dealing with students, dealing with the content creators. And it was really what we saw in, um, uh, you know, again, starting in China in the December, January timeframe, and then spreading to the US quickly through February, March and into April was really an acceleration of plans that people had at some level for many, many years. You know, uh, it, you know, they wanted to get video online and make their courses online or do blended learning or whatever hot title you want to give it this week. You know, it's really just going to tr provide a, a different experience from a typical in-person classroom. So really what a lot of our, our customers were faced with is like, okay, we had this plan. We we're going to do it over four years. Now we basically need to accelerate that and do it over four months. How the heck do we do that? And, and, and um, I think as Eric, you were mentioning like, you know, Hey, I've never turned on the LMS. <laughs> I never wanted to use that. You know, like what's Moodle, what's canvas, you know, I know it's there. And, and then, you know, that, I mean, that's, that's the easy step of just turning that on because it doesn't require somebody to be in front of a camera and recording themselves. And, you know, as we hear a lot of times, I hate how my, my voice sounds. I don't sound that way. Do I really sound that way? Yes, you do. But, you know, so there, there's, you know, it's really a, a, a three-pronged approach you're seeing. You know, it's a, it's a combination of, you know, what do you do in the LMS? That, that's kind of pillar number one we'd see. Number two is how are you going to conduct class? Is it purely on demand videos? Is it interactive stuff like you'd get in like a Zoom or a GoToMeeting or WebEx or something like that? And then three, how are you going to store those, store that content you're building? So video, we're all here probably in 
love the most. But you know, there's other stuff like documents and interactive tutorials and quizzes and all these other things you build to create engagement. So it's 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 been a hard problem. It's been a lot a lot of sleepless nights just trying to keep up with the the workload and trying to help everybody just figure out the best solution for them. So that that's been my past few months. And we had we, a we had an ahead. interesting question come in about the um, that that's relevant to this kind of reaction. So when it was it, it deals with the digital divide, the homework gap, the last mile issue with uh, network connectivity. About how do we how do we help uh, students who, who their school shut down. And they don't have internet at home. So, you know, um, I know Comcast has like a $10 a month uh, service for people that are on SNAP program and things like that. Um, at our university, we have a, a bus system that drives, it's a shuttle from, from Champaign-Urbana to Chicago, and it has uh, high-speed Wi-Fi in it. So we, we moved those buses and parked them in kind of poorer parts of town to provide internet access. And also the school districts. Uh, the, the park district added Wi-Fi to a lot of the parks where students can go to, to um, um, study online. So Justin, do you, do you have any, uh, any reports from Columbus about th this response to digital divide issues? Well, sure. Um, so one of the things that we did pretty early on was being, you know, the huge size that we are, um, we ended up adding networking, Wi-Fi networking to several of the parking lots on main campus and then also at each of our regionals. So, I mean, they still need to physically come to campus, but they can, students can come park in, you know, any of the designated parking lots and have, you know, fast Wi-Fi as fast as they would get in the dorms or any of the rooms. Um, so that's, you know, I mean, kind of as far as we can reach for the last mile, but, um, that we've made that available to any of the students that need to, you know, get connectivity. They can come to campus and, you know, still remain physically distant by coming and parking, stay in their car or, you know, whatnot, um, and being able to handle that. And then we've, you know, that's assuming they have their own, you know, laptop or some sort of physical device like that. But we've also implemented um, our digital flagship initiative where we're giving iPads to the students. So they should have that connectivity or that device to utilize the connectivity. There's also the kind of more general advice of just using, you know, an encoding ladder where you've got some low bit rate streams that are that are offered for people that just have bad networks. And then uh, for firewalls and things like that, you know, our advice is always like, don't use YouTube because, you know, YouTube is blocked in China, military bases, a lot of corporate firewalls, that sort of thing. Uh, Chris, I, I, can you take it away with the the transition from uh, how did we react to what are we doing moving forward? How are we going to how are we going to raise the bar moving forward? And and now that teachers know how to use these tools generally, how are we going to teach them how to use them really well? Yeah, this uh, this kind of plays off that last topic as well. I, I think a lot of us uh, in the in the spring semester kind of felt like okay, we have to go fully online, uh, and that means we have to create the exact classroom experience on the internet. So, like, everybody assumed, like, oh, I guess we need to use uh, Zoom or go to meeting for, for and, and meet at the regular time each and every week, and it, it turns out that uh, that's not necessarily always the, the right way to do it. Of course, some, some classes, it's, it's necessary to always have a live session, or at least to have sometimes a live session, uh, but kind of focusing on the course design uh, and whether or not it has to really always be live all the time, kind of reconceptualizing and thinking about like, what is the outcome that you're desiring for the course? And are there other ways to achieve that? Um, so for instance, my brother, Dave, he's just finished his first year of college, go Dave. And uh, he's taken a public speaking course. And when I thought of that, I was talking to him. Uh, I, I assumed, oh, they probably just spun up a Zoom session every week and, you know, gave presentations. But he said, no, we used our Zoom sessions just to uh, kind of discuss best practices, like what works, what doesn't work in public speaking. And then all the students actually recorded uh, their public or public speaking presentations uh, privately in their own home and then uploaded them into the LMS where students were able to kind of at, on their own time go in and provide commentary and actually, uh, you know, point out timestamps where like, here's something you said at this point that, you know, you, you, you could have maybe done better, or I really liked how you did this at this point. And students were able to actually kind of go back and watch themselves, which I think was a really interesting uh, way to, to, to do it. I think it's much more helpful in that case to learn that way, because you're replaying your own uh, public speech that you might have only given once and not been able to rewatch. So 
uh, things like that. Just thinking about formatting and uh, knowing the tools well enough to be able to provide suggestions for, for courses and for faculty who are looking to kind of do this uh, to, to, to recreate their classes in an online setting. Similar to what you're saying is, you know, one of the first things that we try to do when we're, when we're trying to help a teacher reconceive the way that they, they teach their class and that the students learn from their class when they move to online is to, to free themselves of the constraints of the physical classroom and that, that whole like the, the, the belief that the 50 minute lecture is some kind of like a, a real optima when it's not, it's just, that's just a result of how, how can you pack people into the rooms at the right times and that sort of thing. It's not, it's, it's something that you can free yourself from and uh, thinking about how, how to best help students learn the material uh, when, when all the, you know, all the rules are, are off. Uh, Eric, what are you, what are you, what are you doing at Notre Dame to uh, move forward? So uh, just a quick note on the previous part as well, that uh, in, in taking care of getting, getting things ready, our triage team, one of the things we had to do was also evaluate how many professors didn't have connection. You know, we're talking about students with computers and connection. Uh, we, we had adjunct professors who didn't have computers and we had major computer systems that had to be accessed, uh, you know, you know, MATLAB, things that are heavier that we had to figure out how to be remoting into. Um, th thankfully, they uh, ha have been able to make it uh, pretty seamless uh, in getting the students to be able to remote into systems that they need uh, heavier computing power to. Uh, we've been able to do that pretty well, but Going forward, we're really looking at, um, like like Bill said, a, a plan for over four years, every classroom having recording capabilities and conferencing capabilities to, in three months, two, two, two and a half months, uh, we, Notre Dame's pushed up the start of uh, the fall semester by two weeks now. Uh, we need to have every room to be able to be hybrid of some students will be able to be on campus and we're expecting some students won't be able to. Uh, so we're with the expectation that uh, every, every professor needs to be able to be recording every session. And that's gonna be a pretty, pretty intense uh, lift here over summer to be equipping uh, a few hundred classrooms uh, going from 15 to like 400 locations to be doing records. Uh, the storage and the data contracts all have to be, you know, doubled, tripled, quadrupled, depending on which, which one you're talking about uh, for the load. Uh, we've already scaled Zoom to be able to handle the conferencing, but uh, the records of Zoom meetings, like we're doing with this one, you know, recording it for later. Uh, when you do a session with your class, you need to be able to record it. Um, we also just built out a full uh, global classroom. So what we've labeled it. Uh, there's uh, another another version. I'm not going to say which university because I'll probably get it wrong. Uh, that had what they call the wow room, and we kind of looked at some of that and uh, made it to where a professor can walk in. There's actual operator there, large multiple screens to be able to see the students, to be able to interact with them more. Uh, more natively as well as you can be natively in video, right? So you have large monitor on one side where everybody's speaking, then a large monitor being able to show who's talking and Surface, uh, Microsoft large Surface, so that they can be doing more diagramming as opposed to needing to have like light board and changing, uh, you know, camera angles to be changing that. But being able to integrate more interactive tools in one location and more dynamic teaching process for those higher end classes that need need more interaction with the professor and with the content to be able to discuss the parts like formulas and outcomes and diagramming so that there's a, a much larger interaction so that's that's what we've equipped some of our studios that way and then for every classroom is going to be uh, equipped with lecture capture and video conferencing. We got a question about um, gear and software. So the, the specific question was what, what uh, tools do we recommend for uh, recording PowerPoint slideshows with audio? And so uh, Justin, you want to take that one? Um, I, I mean, well, we have to, we've got MediaSite deployed at uh, OSU. So we have a handful of rooms that have the hardware 
um, appliance in them, um, but that doesn't scale well to you know 400 plus classrooms. So we've got um, a pretty much a computer installed in all of those. We're using the desktop client. Um, aside from that, um, we're either using Zoom if it's already an interactive call. Um, some people are using Camtasia Studio. Um, we uh, use like um, explain anything if it's on an iPad. Um, so we, I don't think we really have a non-media site single enterprise-wide solution for doing just like narrated PowerPoints, but those are a handful of the apps that I know are being used in different pockets around campus. Does anyone else on the panel have a, have a recommendation? At Penn, we use Panopto. Uh, which also integrates with our LMS, which is Canvas, and uh, that kind of provides uh, that that functionality. So that's that's what we've recommended generally for folks who are looking to do recordings uh, of their classes or lectures. Yeah, we're doing the same thing. Panopto recommendation. Uh, Zoom, of course, does the record natively if they want to do that. We just we just hooked Zoom into Panopto integration. So if they do a Panop uh, a Zoom call we're making it to where it can automatically go into Panopto for long-term storage. And then both of those tools also can automatically show up in their LMS so they can just flip it on. Uh, for video capture devices, if they're just on their own laptop, we recommend just using a webcam. But in other cases, we also do like, you know, Blackmagic Mini uh, Recorder or uh, a couple different, uh, you know, devices. AJA makes a good one. There's a few out there. If you can actually find them in stock, uh, that was one of our issues in the first when we we flipped our studios over was uh, we had to kind of scrounge to find some place that actually had had a few for us to sell us. But uh, yeah, it's pre pretty much uh, whatever tool you have is the best tool to use. <laughs> the old uh, the best camera is the one you got on you. We uh, we got the results of this the most recent poll and uh, it looks like the majority of uh, schools have a a um, a video hosting platform and surprisingly about about half are uh, restricted only for teachers and half uh, students can use too. And pretty much every uh, video platform out there, media site, uh, my school has, has a Kaltura and Ensemble, and um, you know, they all have their own video recorders. The one that I uh, tend to recommend the most though for this is uh, open broadcaster software. So OBS Studio is free open source. It's a really powerful tool. It's in fact what I'm using for the virtual camera that I'm uh, running right now. So this is um, this is my setup here where I got this for laptop and then this box here has a couple of video capture cards in it and then I have a few uh, kind of consumer cameras over here. But uh, OBS can bring in you know anything, uh, any kind of video and it can also record your screen. So OBS is a really a really great uh, tool that I highly recommend. Uh, what kind of what kind of gear transitions have you made, um, Justin? So you know we've gone from uh, you know my team uses FS7s, but we're not shooting much with the uh, the high end cameras until we reopen the, the 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 studios, which actually happens today. So what kind of uh, DIY, what kind of uh, professional cameras uh, and gear have you been looking at recently? Uh, for my group, um, we're still using basically the same stuff that we have been. Um, we've got, um, um, I'm trying to blank, um, the EVA, Panasonic EVA1s are our uh, bread and butter cameras that we take around. Um, and then in our studio, we have Blackmagic Minis. Um, there's a great bang for the buck for, you know, it's a fantastic sensor if you don't have to drag it around. Um, and then the recommendations we're making for people that need to do their own DIY recordings is since um, smartphones and iPads are you know, so ubiquitous now, um, iPad, iographer and padcaster both make really nice uh, enclosures that will give you mounting points for all sorts of different accessories, mics, lights, little tiny teleprompters, all those sorts of things. And then if it's something that they need to do a more um, moving, uh, like a walkthrough tour of a greenhouse or something like that, um, the DJI Osmo Mobile 3 is only like $100, $120. Um, and you you basically just clip on your smartphone and it's an active powered stabilizing gimbal. And that has been fantastic for the people that have used that for, like I said, you know, tutorials and walkthroughs and things like that. Eric or Chris? 
For me, I push uh, improving your sound. So one thing that one thing that we've been recommending a lot are uh, Rode is an Australian microphone company, and Rode makes these little microphones that you can kind of stick on your smartphone. And you know, most teachers have a pretty good smartphone that they can you know shoot things as they see them. And then the Rode on uh, on camera microphone really improves the the quality of the audio recording that they get with the with a phone. Um, yeah, it, it's it's funny. Um... You know, I was just thinking about this the other day, you know, all that fancy gear that, you know, you spent countless hours specking and, uh, and uh, you know, dreaming about and finally getting budgetary approval to buy is sitting idle right now. And just that, that uh, how, how tragic that is. But uh, we've been mostly trying to use the software solutions that we have um, and, and kind of trying to become power users as much as we can, like using Zoom to the max to the fullest of its abilities and using things like OBS. So like knowing about like digging deep into the Zoom settings and figuring out that you can, you know, broadcast a Zoom meeting to YouTube Live or to Facebook Live right from within the Zoom interface is really useful. Or being able to use Zoom to, you know, record gallery view and speaker view and the PowerPoint slides or the, you know, shared screen all as individual video feeds is just really helpful things to know about that are, are, are real game changers when it comes to kind of doing this work and also in, in enabling others to kind of take control um, of what they're doing. And kind of for more polished events, we've been actually using Zoom meetings to kind of bring people together and then using that as an input in like something like OBS or uh, Wirecast and being able to kind of put titles on top of things or you know I I integrate other elements that we like to have to make a more polished product. What you said there, Chris, made me, made me think, um, as we kind of creep back to the new normal after uh, COVID-19, what do you think all these faculty will think when they, when they realize, you know, they had, to, they had to learn all this stuff on their own at home, do it yourself, and then they'll get back to campus and they'll see like, wow, Chris, Eric, Justin, they have these wonderful studios that they can do. What, what do you think the reaction will be when they first see like, you know, a real, you know, this is how it's really done set up. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, so we, we deal with that some right now that uh, we have professors that are changing uh, from doing their own stuff and then they come into the studio. And, and to, to start with, like uh, most, it's a little intimidating. You walk into a green screen with, uh, we run grass valleys uh, in our in our studio, full, full uh, production control rooms. And so when a professor first walks in, they're, they're a little... Uh, little intimidated by it with the lights hitting them as most people are um and they definitely appreciate the difference in the quality of what it looks like uh, you know that that's one of the post conversations that they also have is you know how much they they appreciate the look of the quality over you know the, the zoom qu quantity right um you know so it's uh, that that interaction with the professors were already, of course, increased a bunch. But like you said, when they start coming back to campus and we start having this conversation of, okay, you can go to your normal classroom and we're going to sh shoot a camera at you, or you can come in and use the global classroom where you get to interact with the students, big and huge. And um, we already are seeing those that know about it are much more interested in teaching out of that space than a normal classroom space. Uh, just because it has a, a greater connection to the distant learning uh, people, the, the people that aren't, aren't on uh, physically there, they're able to see the expressions, you're able to read the students, you're able to get more connection. Um, when you don't have that, some, some professors, uh, especially a professor that's never taught online, um, finds it difficult to talk to a piece of glass of a camera to be able to have the same feeling of dynamics of talking. A lot of times uh, uh, what, I've, what we've seen in the past is you always need to make sure your camera operator is the only person in the line eyesight because the professor still wants to talk to somebody and they will talk to whoever is actually in the room. So if you have a producer off to the side, they're going to look over and be talking to them as opposed to the camera. And so that um, limiting the physical presence of people, even though they don't have that audience, it keeps them engaged with only the one location. It is definitely 
something that we've seen that helps when they do come in to do, do those records is put, put the cameraman right there so they have eye contact with somebody and they feel more comfortable with it. And also teleprompter for those that are comfortable with it. Don't use a teleprompter if you're not comfortable with it because it just makes it even more uncomfortable though. Yeah, or, or, or put something on the teleprompter other than things to read. So like pictures of smiling students, that sort of thing. One, of, one other trick that I like to do is I take one of my daughter's stuffed animals and set it on top of the camera. And then I tell the story to the teacher. And then whenever they look at the camera, they tend to smile. Uh, we got a question about uh, captioning, which is a, a really interesting question. And then we have a poll going now about, um, you know, at what, at what point do captions become so inaccurate and misleading that they, they stop being of value? Bill, what can, you, uh, what can you tell us about what you're hearing about captioning? Because we have basically two different, uh, two different problems that we're addressing now, which is one, the scale has gone up, and two, we're having to deal with a lot of asynchronous or synchronous captioning where live captioning or is needed. Yeah, cap captioning has always been a pretty hot topic even before COVID. And, uh, you know, keeping the legal ramifications aside, uh, you know, a lot of my customers are saying, okay, do we want to provide captions? Is automatic speech to text or automatic speech recognition or ASR, um, you know, machine captions, are those good enough? Or do we need to do something better and have somebody review it and, you know, get it closer to 100% accuracy. And, you know, we, we see, a, I see a wide variety of, of um, I guess, decisions of what people want to do. So some, some customers say, you know what, we're doing no captions unless it's specifically requested. And they're still taking that approach, even though all the content is on demand. Um, other ones are saying, we're going to just do automatic speech to text. We're going to run it through IBM Watson or 3Play or AST or um, one of those providers with kind of the the less expensive solution typically. And then they'll, um, in our software, we can set a threshold. So if it exceeds a certain amount of accuracy, it turns the caption on automatically. If it doesn't, you know, the instructor is expected to go in and clean it up before they publish it. Um, so that, that's kind of one approach. And then the final approach is that, you know, they just say, all right, we're going to reserve a few hundred thousand dollars to a few million dollars a year to, to caption it and, and do it accurate and and do what I usually call human captioning, where it's somebody actually listing the track and captioning. Another hot topic that's coming up right now is audio descriptions. Um, you know, so it's the description of the of what is going on in that scene at the time. So if a person's talking, not terribly exciting, um, but if they're doing a demonstration, you know, there's, there could be a description of that that needs to be done as well. So that's another thing that's coming on top of that, just the speech to text type cap captioning and transcriptions. And that is generally more expensive to do as well because you got to kind of smash that into the normal text chat. So when, when we've seen our customers do tests, I've seen some say, all right, you know, 95, 95% accuracy is good enough. Some others are saying, you know, 98, 99% accuracy. And it really depends on the topic you're covering. I mean, it, I, I, would, I would guess I would challenge all of you as you're looking at captions and you're trying to test this and put yourself in the shoes of somebody that really needs it. Take your own video, watch it on mute, with the caption on, you know, does it make sense? Is it working? Can you, can you get through that? And then take one of your partners or another video and just watch it with captions on and, and see if 80% is really good enough. Sometimes you miss the main point of the message and it's like, you might as well not have the caption. It's almost misleading at that point. So there is no one size fits all. We don't see one clear answer across the board. It's always a big discussion about what works best for each person. So sorry, I don't have the slam dunk, you know, 98%, that's the exact answer everybody needs. It's, it's really a discussion. I'd love to hear from the other people in the field, you know, Chris, Chris and Justin and Eric, what, what are you seeing in person at your you know, universities? I would also real quick throw out that depending on what the lexicon of the content is, that's going to make a big difference on what's the acceptable accuracy level. Because if you're using medical terms, chemistry, things like that, that's going to be, you know, a much higher um, accuracy that's going to be needed before you versus something that's just like, you know, standard colloquial English where you've got, you know, very run of the mill common words being used. So. No, you're um, totally right. And we, we've seen uh, the other big, the other big thing going back to the technical discussion is audio quality. Audio quality makes a huge difference. If you're coming in off your laptop audio, I don't know, my MacBook does a pretty good job. I've seen some Dell workstations do pretty good. Some older laptops are just horrid. <laughs> um, and if you got background noise or fuzz or vent noise in the room, it, it, it's going to take that accuracy, just drop it really quickly. And then heavy, heavy one, accents as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're seeing all that. So with a lot of our universities that are trying to do like a big rollout, you know, they, they would do a ton of tests based on, you know, the room, it would be a varying difference. So if it's a lapel mic, that's pretty close. You'd get pretty good if it's one of those, you know, rock star mics that come around the face and go right in front of it. 
you know, the pop singer mics, if you will, those do an even better job, but people feel weird wearing that kind of like the teleprompter discussion. You throw that on a normal, normal person. That's not a presenter. They're going to be like, what is this? This is really awkward. I don't know what to do. You know? So it's about picking the tools that that person, that presenter, that content creator is comfortable with and doing the best you can with it. We've done yeah, a lot for- of research on captioning and, and audio descriptions and, um, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough problem. Eric, what you got? Yeah, for, for us, uh, definitely the large events, some of the more um, h- highlighted events, we're having, you know, the full live captioner call in, had, had to work through, uh, you know, the workflow in different locations that we, were, we weren't as uh, used to doing of, you know, okay, this encoder needs to be configured that way. And this, um, you know, YouTube takes it this way if you mark it just right. Uh, you know, the, the working out that workflow in different locations was, was a new thing. Uh, we were used to doing captionings in, you know, for in venue for everything, of course, uh, for the, you know, large sporting events. But then when we're starting to change our workflows, uh, we had to also figure out captioning in a different workflow. Uh, but uh, the auto captioning, uh, we still consider that to be, you know, okay for when you're scrubbing the video and we use it a lot for uh, the, the students to be able to find their content. You know, how do you, how do you get to this? And we, we see that in the analytics of, you know, students use it to get to the part where professors talking about X, but sometimes, you know, like you said, depending on if what kind of terminology that is, whether the auto captioning actually understands that word and being able to find it uh, a good, good balance. But, um, yeah, auto captioning definitely is not there for being full live production on its own. If you're really expecting to be uh, compliant to, for somebody to be able to, uh, th- that's hearing impaired, to be able to watch a video, like you said, uh, turn the audio off on your own and see, see if you understand the content. Uh, it's not, not quite there. So we, we do live captioning for the large stuff and auto captioning uh, for some of this smaller stuff for for more of that searching. Yeah, for 99% accurate captions, the 1% is probably the words that you really need to learn and, and you wanna have the, the, you wanna have the transcript correct so that you can, if you're not familiar with the word, you wanna be able to look it up. Uh, one of the faculty here wrote, wrote his own uh, video platform and what it does is it seeds the captions using uh, Microsoft Azure's speech to text and then students are able to edit them. So if a student sees a failure, they can correct it. And what we've talked about, like the ideal solution for at scale would be something like that. Automatic speech recognition with some kind of like a wiki mechanism on top of it where if a student graffitis it, it can get, it can get corrected and reputation scores can be made, that sort of thing where you could figure out how trustworthy different editors are, that sort of thing. Uh, we did get the, uh, the poll results for this question too, and it looks like just about everybody's much more tolerant of uh, error rates than I am. <laughs> so, uh, I guess we're pickier. <laughs> yeah. So let's say, um, um, <clears throat> what kind of um, what kind of broad trends do you guys see moving forward? So we're, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, uh, after COVID-19, you know, a lot has changed. You know, all the faculty have, have seen have, have had to do this. So what, what broadly is going to happen over the next few years? Chris, you want to take that one? Well, I mean, for the short term, I'm not sure about everybody else's educational institution, but UPenn is still undecided about how the fall is exactly going to play out. Um, it, it, it's, there's a few options on the table, but in, in any case, it feels like trying to plan an outdoor wedding where you have plan A and you hope that goes well, but you have a whole nother plan B and you hope plan B is as good as plan A, but you really want to do plan A. Uh, So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, We need to have a plan B in place uh, either way. um, If, you know, plan B might become plan A. So what we're, um, what what I think we're going to see is definitely more hybrid courses where, and, and this has been, you know, concept of flipped classroom has been around for a long time, but more, serious implementation where anything that's lectury or, um, you know, just informational will be, you know, pre-recorded in class time when you do get together. It might be in limited amounts or smaller groups or whatever it might be. That, that time will be really dedicated to interactivity 
and gaining the value you can only get, uh, you know, being in person and having a discussion or having a hands-on lab or something like that. I definitely think one one uh, change here is going to be uh, everybody's comfort level of video conferencing has gone up. So wa even walking across campus when we come back is going to decrease because you know you don't need to be in physical proximity to everybody for every meeting. Uh, I I think we're you know we're never going to go back to where we were four months ago. Uh, Everything is going to be more video oriented we already had that trend the past few years i i think we're going to definitely exponentially increase that uh, over this process that uh, we're, we're going to be even more video oriented because everybody's used to it during this uh mandatory time of doing it and everybody's comfort level is increased with with having to do it so we won't go back to four months ago. Don't know where exactly it'll land in between the where we're at now and where we were four months ago, but definitely an increase. The latest poll was a kind of fun one about uh, emoji in in Zoom to, that might help out uh, with teaching. And your mic is off is the most popular one. And there are very few Steve Martin fans, apparently not, not much love for Murmur. Chris, you wanna take that question too? About uh, uh, so long-term trends? Oh, well, long-term trends, I was just, um, it, you know, just, yeah, seeing more, uh, more and more online uh, video. And um, uh, I, I think there's also going to, no matter what the format is, uh, one thing I think we've learned uh, in greater amounts over the past couple of months is that students kind of create, uh, crave that, you know, interactivity, no matter what the format is, whether it's, in person or online, they they want to feel connected. They uh, they, they they don't want to just watch uh, you know pre-recorded videos and have no way of discussing. That that's kind of the YouTube experience, you know, um, where you're kind of learning alone and you feel siloed. So kind of uh, uh, you know having video, but having strong instructor presence and facilitation to make it uh, in a way that it's engaging. Um, something that I saw that was really interesting was like the concept of posting uh, video in discussion forums and having prompts. So having that pre-recorded aspect uh, of an instructor giving you know, an assignment, but putting that video right in the discussion so that people can respond right there. And then you have a lively discussion that stems from a pre-recorded video. So kind of finding creative ways to uh, uh, you know, keep that interactivity, keep that feeling of connectedness and um, you know, being able to learn from one another um, between students and faculty, I think is going to continue to be huge, especially in the online space. Justin, did you want to make any bold predictions? I'm not sure how bold they are, but um, I, I would say we're going to see an increased um, interest and demand for um, online education. Um, and there's definitely still going to be the, the place for the in-person, you know, local physical education and whether it be you know lab work or you know, even just standard uh, classroom stuff but OSU actually saw an increase in its enrollments for summer after we had made the announcement that we were going to be doing online all of the courses online for the term um, and, and I just it, even if it's whether it's uh, synchronous or asynchronous um, it seems to fit people's schedules better um, or at least not you know blanketly across the board but um, it people, the students seem to be uh, accepting that and embracing it fairly well. Very good. Yeah, one of the, uh, the bold predictions that I would make is that camping will be big. I think that everybody's so virtual and it's just like, uh, just get out in the woods, get a, you know, disconnect and enjoy the, enjoy the nature. Uh, we had an interesting question coming about um, hybrid classrooms uh, when we come back. So the, the term that Educause has been throwing around is, is uh, de-densification. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a sensible COVID-19 um, uh, withdrawal would be to kind of like take your occupancy rates and then say like, okay, no, no more than 33% of occupancy, that sort of thing. So if it's 33%, then a class that meets three times a week, you have some creative, uh, some creative scheduling that you could do where some of the classes online, they meet in cohorts in the classroom. Have, have any of you uh, been participating in discussions about how you're gonna de-densify, how are you gonna come back in some kind of a hybrid fashion, Eric? 
Yeah. So one one specific thing is uh, large classes. You know, the 200, 400 count uh, classes. Uh, we're definitely in conversations. No, nothing solid, and I'm not a policymaker, so let's let's make sure that uh, I clear, clearly state that. But uh, the conversations are staying in more of that hybrid or online uh, teaching model for the really big ones. Uh, our, our lecture halls uh, will, of course, be all, all booked out, whereas you know normally the 300 seat room, the 400 seat room. It's normally maybe a quarter of the time scheduled. Now that's that's one of the higher higher scheduled spaces, but also all auditoriums uh, for you know what's normally used for concerts is being looked at as uh, regular classrooms throughout the day instead of only being used for uh, events in the evening. Um, they're looking at every one of them being for uh, larger rooms to be able to de-densify as well. Chris or Justin? Uh, OSU is doing um, the same. We haven't gotten any specifics announced yet. Um, and I'm, again, I'm not part of the uh, policy or decision making group, but um, we're definitely going to more of a hybrid approach where, yeah, the three, four, five, six hundred seat classroom isn't going to be the same, you know, completely fill the room. You know, we're going to be doing definitely some sort of a hybrid approach. And Bill, what are you seeing kind of broadly across the uh, the planet? Yeah, I'm seeing a combination of de-densifying the, the big lecture halls. That seems to be a hot topic. So what uh, Eric and Justin both mentioned. Um, I see an increase in the studio. I'll, I'll put in air quotes, studio. So Eric and, and, and the other team here, you guys sound like you have some pretty awesome studios. And I've, I've definitely seen some that rival like the big networks, um, what you're looking at for like NBC Chicago or something. But what we've seen a lot of success with is um, a, definitely a lighter version of a studio where an instructor can walk in, press record. There's a camera, there's a microphone, basically bring in the talent. Maybe there's somebody kind of assisting him or her with, you know, getting started, but it's essentially, you know, typically they're, they're cubicles, they're old offices, they're, you know, just a space where you got a decent camera, decent lighting and decent sound. And they just bring in their laptop and share it out that way. So those, those are the three ways I see, we see a lot of people approaching it and then combine that with, um, you know, personal capture for the on-demand stuff, um, you know, to, to pre-record classes, pre-record content. I think another important thing you guys brought up was the idea of putting videos in discussion threads. And that's been the, the instructors that I've seen do that get really good responses and that you're trying to, like when we're all remote, we all have to be very intentional about instilling discussion. We have to ask more questions. You're, you lose out and you, you probably have all seen this in your professional end of end of work as well. You know, you, you lose out on walking down the hall and be like, Hey, John, Johnny, how are you doing? Hey, I got this thing I want to talk to you about real quick. Like that doesn't happen when we're all remote. So likewise with teaching, we have to be very intentional and very uh, matter of fact when we're, we're trying to instill discussion and it feels weird. It feels <laughs> like it feels really kind of, uh, you know, staged and planned and sometimes fake, but that's what you got to do. And I've, Slowly learned that over my years of managing a team remotely. It, I can't just bump into my guys. I've done it. I've, we, I bumped into them at airports, but you know, uh, not not at your home office. So I think those are all things that we got to keep in mind as we're we're rolling out these new forms of learning and these new forms of working too. There's two aspects of everything that we do. The final poll results are in, and uh, it was about form factor on microphones. And lately, I've been I've been recommending stand mics. So in the past, it was always head mount or lavalier just because I wanted to keep it consistently close to the teacher's uh, mouth. But the stand mics, now that they're on video a lot more than they're not just recording just audio or just the, the screen, I want, their, I want their head to stay in the same spot. And so the stand mic serves as a leash. Uh, we had one fun question come in that was uh, kind of about graduations. And my team handles most of the graduations at our school, except for the, the main one is kind of a partnership between us and then did the vision of intercollegiate athletics as most of it. Chris, do you want to talk about that? I know you're a big fan of uh, the live streaming part of the job. Yeah, um, unfortunately, we didn't end up really doing a, a, a true live uh, stream this year for graduation. Uh, we we kind of did a you know, we, we put together a really nice uh, video that, that kind of streamed live and everybody was able to watch it live, but uh, uh, it, it wasn't the good old fashioned, uh, you know, but we're, we're, we're doing it live, you know, it, it was a very nice polished um, 
uh, production. And, um, you know, if we're still in this mode next year, we will have more time maybe to prepare for, uh, uh, you know, more, more uh, traditional live stream. We, we definitely did a traditional live stream, but with also some video rolling components. Um, you know, let, like you said, we, we, we do have a large facility that we do full linear broadcasts out of. Uh, and so we have, you know, some of the professors, so, some of the deans came in and did pre-rolled stuff that we rolled out of uh, Dreamcatcher. Uh, but then uh, we actually had a full um, three, three camera shoot in the studio with uh, three people and on green screen and, you know, with a virtual background to kind of give a little bit more of a feeling of, you know, actually being there. We didn't call it a commencement. We call it a conferral service ceremony because, you know, some, some students who are going on to uh, doctoral programs need a conferred degree. Uh, but we're planning on doing an actual full commencement in 2021 for all of the students and all of the departments. And so we've told all of them plan for um, Memorial Day weekend next year to be coming back to campus for actual commencement ceremonies. But we did uh, uh, a full live production with closed captioning with multiple platforms um, for, for our conferral service. OSU did basically the same sort of thing. We did a, a live stream of commencement with a handful of pre-produced pieces at the beginning, and then you know three thousand ish degrees um, being virtually given, um, and then we're date to be determined, but going to do a, another physical commencement for it sometime down the road. And all of that on our side was handled by our uh, the university's PBS station. I've been, I support uh, high schools around here too in uh, theatrical aspects. And I've been telling all the kids like, you know, you, you might've missed out on your graduation, but you're gonna have the best reunions. Like the class of 2020 reunions are gonna be epic. Uh, we are out of time. So we're gonna get a crook at some point. I'm not sure how Eric's gonna do that, but we did have one interesting question come in about uh, AV1, the codec. Um, Bill, do you know if uh, Mediasite has any plans to roll AV1? So I know that it's it's being used in Netflix and YouTube, and um, you know this was uh, this is a result of uh, YouTube YouTube's acquisition or Google's acquisition of On2 many years ago. Yeah, we're definitely looking into AV1 and switching to that um, at some point. Right, right now it's still uh, kind of in the early engineering stages and roadmap. It's just um, what what we find is, you know, our, our real technical customers they they love knowing codecs. Most of our customers are like, we need it to work and don't want any uh, strange licensing fees that go with the content and all that. So it's on the roadmap. We're always looking into it, but it's a, it's a pretty big heavy lift to switch over from like an H.264 uh, normal codec. So yeah, looking at it, it's just uh, when you compare it with all the other things that our customers are looking for, a lot of times like, you know, the bulk of the people are like, I don't care <laughs> as long as it works. You know, we needed to work and, and simplicity is usually the top demand when we're getting into this uh, type of space, just because it, it, it's got to work reliably, it's got to work well, and it's got to be available. Because if, again, like the, like the old comment, if, you know, the best camera is the camera you have in front of you, you know, it's the same thing too. Like if, if, if you got to get the recording where it can be and it's got to play where you want it and how it gets there, we don't care as long as it works. So. Yeah, for me, the, the, the weight is for encoding times to come down. So the AV1 encoding just is a lot more resource intensive than you know H.264, which you do in a chip and that sort of thing. We also had a question about standard kits. So uh, does anybody have kind of like go bags for, for teachers to pick up and that has uh, some kind of set in it or does anybody have any? We, we like have that? a couple kits. We, we check out kits for our uh, professors with uh, a Logitech, um, camera like the one that I'm using here today just the the, the little small form factor ones and a little bitty uh, desktop stand and uh, don't remember which microphone just a simple little uh, microphone to be putting on it and a laptop uh, we have like a dozen of those kits that uh, we've we've had for almost two years already just because you know not every classroom is equipped with it not every professor's uh, ready to do it. So we already had some of those and I believe we're uh, increasing that that count as well. Chris or Justin? 
one thing that we had that was a kind of like our go-to checkout kit was a uh, it was a little bag, a little photograph uh, camera bag, you know, and it had a, a Zoom Q series camera in it. So those are, you know, the cameras that have a really nice mic array. And then we would glue googly eyes to the dead to the dead cat uh, wind sock that you can put on the thing so that the teacher has something to smile at. But the the camera itself, you know, it's got kind of like a fish eye, so it's not it's not perfect, but it, it was something that that worked and that uh, you know you could record pretty good sound in a pretty full foolproof way. Chris, uh, well, uh, I was just going to say um, we we might have some kits somewhere on campus. We're pretty decentralized at Penn, but one of the things we've been doing also has been just providing places on campus that are kind of equipped that faculty can go that are outfitted with the equipment they need to kind of uh, put together a recording uh, for their classes. I also like the, the IV cam is a, is a kind of an, a smartphone app that turns your smartphone into either an IP or a, or a tethered USB camera. We've been using those since, you know, um, a lot of webcams are back ordered and that looks like Eric is coming with the crook now. Yes, I am. Uh, this was a terrific panel. Thank you so much to all of our panelists uh, and Liam. Uh, thanks to you for moderating and thanks to all of our attendees for questions as you hopefully have seen in the chat. Uh, most of our panelists have shared their email addresses and uh, have expressed a willingness to help you with any questions that you might have that we did not get the time to get to during today's panel. I'd like to once again thank MediaSite for sponsoring this panel and thank Limelight Networks for sponsoring all of Streaming Media East Connect.